Indeed, I would like to give you a little bit an uh, idea why uh, in Innovine we did some activities on uh, uh, identifying, trying to identify new sources of resistance. The breeders have uh, uh, done a lot of work and I think it's centuries of breeders uh, which should be mentioned. And I would like to focus my uh, uh, talk on the diseases. We could do similar things maybe uh, in a different manner uh, for the abiotic stress, which is also a topic or was a topic in uh, uh, the Innovine project. So the needs for new uh, disease resistance are well known. Those uh, uh, who have seen vineyards without any treatment, they will find plants looking like this, heavily uh, powdered with powder mildew or heavily treated uh, uh, and stressed with downy mildew. Uh, we have, uh, uh, if you look on a larger scale of the last about 200 uh, years, uh, some incidents, the pests and diseases came into Europe. Uh, in America, there have been previously, starting from the settlers centuries before, uh, trials to develop new genotypes which resist the conditions in North America and there the North American hybrids developed. Later on in Europe, the diseases uh, came, created similar problems. Uh, a class uh, which is called uh, French hybrids have been developed and in general, to those genotypes, they are considered as being uh, of poor quality, which isn't one or the other case, surely, uh, to be uh, uh, re-evaluated. And there are a few ones which are uh, through rather uh, good in terms of quality. But anyway, those genotypes did not succeed on the, uh, the market. Um, we uh, have the rootstocks, uh, uh, which are successful, and we have a gap in between uh, in terms of releases of cultivars in, in Europe. And nowadays, we do have uh, what we think are uh, classically bred, highly resistant and uh, um, uh, high quality genotypes. These kind of genotypes permit a reduced uh, plant protection treatment, they are not immune. That's some message which we need to pass to the public and to the wine growers. They are not immune. They need uh, support by chemical plant protection. But uh, there are two concepts on this picture to treat the diseases. The one concept was the first uh, uh, which was uh, uh, used, the treatment with sulfur and copper, so fungicides. And the second was the development of the new cultivars, which is a really long-lasting process, and I would briefly address this point. But having first a look on the resistance to fungicides, also fungicides are endangered from being uh, overcome by resistance of the pathogen. It's not only the case with the resistance gene uh, as addressed by uh, François Delmotte. Here you see uh, a number of classes of fungicides which have been introduced into the market. And uh, if you see to those three which are highlighted, already two years after introduction into the market, the first resistances emerged. So disease resistance, uh, fungicide resistance is a long lasting problem. And it's also something which we need to uh, take into consideration for our future strategies. Our uh, big problem, I think, is uh, um, that the development of fungicides resulting in a new project uh, will be on a large-scale application. So uh, the new fungicides goes into existing vineyards, insisting uh, wheat fields or barley fields or whatever, and then you have uh, a real massive pressure on those, uh, uh, genotype, on those uh, fungicides because uh, you go into a large area. Biology and uh, genetics mutations are always a function of numbers and you'll provide to the system already a huge area which is uh, something totally different with new cultivars. You start with few, very few plants, so the development of resistances is something which is uh, uh, delayed. So just to remind you how the principle in grapevine breeding works, so we use traditional cultivars of high wine quality but without resistances and we use the resistances, and Bruce uh, mentioned this very nicely, uh, from wild species or selections uh, and combine the desired characters to come finally into cultivars, new cultivars of high resistance and high uh, quality. 
Um, showing uh, uh, this image gives you an overview of uh, almost uh, 90 years of breeding activities in Germany. And Valentin Blattner is here. Also, some of his selections are on the list. So it's maybe not Germany only, but uh, also Swiss. Um, and we started in Germany, at least, uh, in 1925 with the breeding activities. And uh, one of the first cultivars which showed that it's definitely possible to combine resistance and quality is the cultivar Aris or the cultivar uh, Siegfried Rebe. Unfortunately, those cultivars have had other drawbacks and they could not persist on the market. But the principle of combination of resistance and quality was documented with these genotypes. Later on, and we jump in the year 1992, Phoenix came onto uh, um, the market. It was the first new selection from a series of selections which are shown and indicated. By the way, in red are indicated red wine cultivars. So currently, we have approximately 30 cultivars in Germany from whole breeding programs and uh, can now start on the market. And the market can decide what is good and uh, uh, what is the best performing. And if you go through these cultivars and do the wine tastings, you gradually see an improvement in quality in these cultivars. So from the top to the bottom, the quality increased, so the breeders had uh, definitely considerably success also in improving the quality even in this small set of genotypes. So quality is in principle not an issue. It's a matter of work and a matter of time to define it, but it's a, a problem which can be solved. So there was a parallel development, and that's the development of the identification of resistance loci. So they started, you see REN2, uh, work of uh, uh, the group on Bruce Reich uh, in, uh, 90, in 2000, and later on the RPV1 is mentioned, and there are a few others. So currently, we do have a set of resistance loci, but not all of the resistance loci are in a good genetic background at the moment. So not everything can really be used in the breeding program for elite variety uh, development. So, but there is something, but I think there are also some, some drawbacks uh, uh, in between. So if you look and combine those two uh, time uh, frames, uh, you see there is a big gap in between. What we see as cultivars today are thinking and work maybe 30 years ago or even before. It's not what we think now and what we could do now. There are different developments, and so there is a, a future and a perspective uh, for development in breeding. We need new and other resistances. There are three resistance loci and cycled. Those are the most relevant, and unfortunately, from those selections we are indicating here, that's the only resistance loci from this whole pool which have been transferred into cultivars for today, which are cultivars ready for the market. I think there is a lot to do to use and to add new resistances, and Bruce nicely mentioned the topic of pyramiding resistance as well as uh, phosphoride. And the question of durability was addressed already in the previous talk, and I will make this point again. Bianca is the example, uh, it has two resistance loci, the RPV3-1 and the REN3. And if you do uh, an assay, you see that the Bianca, there are uh, a few dots here. It's a considerably reduced infection, but unfortunately, there is infection. And as long as there is infection, inf infection possible, also, uh, evolution can take place on this disk. So development of resistances can take place. And indeed, the next uh, uh, shows that there are strains available which uh, overcome the resistance. So in the, in the left, you see almost no difference between those two uh, images, leave this in the comparison of Bianca and Chardonnay. And if you compare the isolate SL uh, in terms of uh, uh, the resistance QTL, uh, the QTL has disappeared, and this is work which has already been mentioned uh, uh, by uh, Bresotti at co and co-workers. So the topic of durability of resistance is the same topic as the durability of uh, fungicidal 
uh, work and uh, activity functioning. So we have two strategies and we have always the same problem and now we think, I think we need to address this problem in a clever and future-oriented way in terms to reduce plant protection intensity and also to secure the producer uh, in terms of uh, personal safety and environmental safety. To stress again this point of the disease resistance, I show you this uh, image uh, uh, showing the classical boom and bust cycle. It shows you uh, uh, the introduction of resistance gene in oats. As more area is available, the more the pathogen uh, resisting this, uh, this race, this, this uh, resistance gene came up and after a while the people had a new resistance gene, the bond resistance gene, and uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, delay the resistance pathogens appeared. So that is the same situation as we observe it for Bianca. Nothing different and a known, well-known principle. But compared to other crops for the grape wine, we have one additional and important difference. Other crops have a turnover of cultivars in maybe five, ten years on the market. Grape wines, if they are very good and successful, are on the market for decades or some for centuries. Riesling, for example, the first mentioning in 1435, and there are other examples around. So the grape wine cultivars are used in the case, in a good case, for a long, long time, and in the meantime, they are used all over the world. So if we have one day a very successful new breeding line and a new cultivar, we should consider that it should work for more than 10 years, it should work for decades, even longer, and it could eventually be something which is used in various wine-growing regions. So that's a, a tiny consideration we need to keep in mind uh, for our strategy and our working. And I would like to give you a few examples uh, on resistances and combinations of resistances uh, from the mildew, downy mildew uh, topic. I could show the similar things for powdery mildew, but I will focus on downy for time reasons. So we have here some crossing schemes, and you see uh, on the top the parents, uh, an offspring, which were again crossed with another one, and there were genotypes selected. They have now a number, but they have two resistant loci. And uh, the principle is very uh, clear. You can get plants without resistance uh, at the bottom left. You can plant, get plants with one resistance or with a combination uh, of two. And those are the ones which breeders today look for. And if you look for the resistance behavior, it's very interesting to compare. Here are the parents of this particular cross, which are somewhere in the middle. And there are genotypes which are very susceptible, but there are also genotypes which appear to be very resistant. That are the ones we would like to see. But uh, what is the uh, function and the degree of resistance of the individual resistance gene and uh, how are the uh, effects in combining such resistances. Currently, we unfortunately do not know the mechanisms. So the best thing breeders can do, they can do some trials and some combinations. For this particular example, you see here the average of the susceptibility or, susceptibility or resistance. In this case, it's a susceptibility. That's a set of genotypes which do not show any one of the two resistance loci. Here we have uh, genotypes with the RPV3, so the average moves to the right, but in both <coughs> cases, entire resistance genotypes uh, are not available and not found. For the RPV10, the movement is again to higher resistance, and the few genotypes appear in this assay to have entire resistance, which is most likely to be a result uh, from the particular experiment, and if you will redo it off frequent enough, you will come also to a slightly different conclusion. But in the end, the addition of the resistance moves the average towards more resistant plants. And the combination is even more resistant, and there we have a number of higher resistant genotypes. That's a good situation, that's a good message, but still, the majority of these genotypes here 
is still not entirely resistant. So they will probably be genotypes permitting a small growth of downy mildew and also the development of resistant races. That's the expectation we do have from this material. Here is another example. It's now a cross uh, with an RPV1 and RPV10 locus, so it's different resistance low size, at least the one is different. You get a similar uh, pattern of uh, progenies and uh, you can uh, look for those plants which are entirely without resistance lo loci. They are low, uh, very low in resistance, of course. With the RPV1, it's a medium resistance. With the RPV10, it's a higher resistant. And the combination is, again, some additional effect uh, to be observed. We are now in a situation to even add a more resistance genes. And this is shown in this example. So from the first uh, uh, crosses here, we have a combination of RPV1, RPV1 and RPV3. We combine it with the genotype which carries RPV12. And this is this genotype. And the situation in terms of uh, progeny becomes more complex. The more resistant gene you try to combine, the more complex the situation becomes. And the larger the populations need to be to achieve your, your goal or the more crosses you need to do to get uh, the desired genotypes. How does the uh, addition of the resistance uh, work? Without resistance, we have a very poor uh, response, so meaning all the plants are susceptible. With the RPV1, we got a medium. With the, uh, sorry, with the, yes, with the RPV1, we got a medium uh, response. With the RPV3, it's lower, it's a bit higher than uh, susceptibility. This is the, geno the, the resistance locus, which is endangered uh, and sometimes uh, already broken. And the RPV12 is uh, uh, very high. The combination of the resistances uh, seems to be very uh, interesting. RPV1 and RPV3-1 in combination is higher than the RPV1. The RPV1 plus 12 is even higher and the RPV3 and 12 also very high. So the addition of resistances is very uh, straightforward and the combination of all three shows the highest resistance. This is something which we observe in our breeding material and downy mildew is probably the most difficult uh, um, uh, disease in terms of managing of resistance because we have a number of medium resistance loci around uh, and uh, need this uh, to be addressed in detail. So here's the uh, uh, combination uh, already on two uh, resistance loci. We normally don't see symptoms, which is nice. But as I said, there is a tiny bit of uh, uh, growth of uh, the fungus possible. And so we need some additional uh, work. And I think three resistances are a good uh, final goal. Here on this image, you see the effect of the single resistance loci for down the mildew. And you see the RPV3 is very low in the meantime. Uh, RPV3.2 is higher, and this is uh, uh, quite effective. Uh, RPV10 and 12 are actually the highest resistances we do have in hands. So what is the idea for long term? For the long term, it's the combination of three resistance loci uh, against powdery mildew and downy mildew. And as we do have more than three loci, we can combine the different loci and we will get uh, the possibility to create plants uh, in different resistance combinations. So if we use this kind of approach, we will result in different cultivars coming out, having different resistances and contributing to a certain diversity in terms of resistance in the future cultivars. And uh, let me summarize and stop uh, this, consider uh, this uh, 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 consideration. Uh, we should ask the question, what could and what should be done from the breeding point of view? There are a number of points, some which are quite idealistic, I know this, uh, and we need also to consider uh, the realities. Uh, I think we should focus on the major pathogens, uh, but uh, we need also to look for other pathogens uh, black rot has been mentioned, antrachnose has been mentioned. Um, this is uh, a point. If we reduce the huge amount of plant protection in, in viticulture, 
other pathogens will come up and emerge. Uh, we should identify new and strong sources of resistance. This is in particular true for downy mildew, but also for powder mildew. In order to get a higher diversity on the long term, we should combine different resistance loci, ideally three. We have uh, cultivars in the pipeline, all the breeders, uh, with two, geno two loci combined. Uh, we don't know the mechanisms. Uh, it would be nice to know the mechanism, to think on the long term more about combining different mechanisms, to have not doubling uh, of uh, uh, mechanisms. And I would strongly recommend to avoid uh, the burning of resistance to circumvent this problem. Uh, uh, if we use stepwise single resistance genes and introduce them with new cultivars in the market, we will definitely create the problem that we step by step burn the individual resistances if the plants get a certain area. I know also strongly uh, argue for a minimum of plant protection. Uh, a plant protection against uh, uh, Mites could be done with sulfur. Sulfur does also work against uh, uh, powdery mildew. And this kind of treatment to appropriate time and where the plants are very sensitive could uh, stabilize uh, the resistances so they get a kind of a fourth mechanism. Uh, this is something which uh, um, is surely uh, important to know and to be realized by the producers that even if the cultivars are very good in resistance, they should have some support by chemical plant protection, by the minimum of plant protection. And we should create varieties with different combinations of resistances. This is something which is an outcome of the work. And we surely look to questions of climate change. Uh, Bruce uh, mentioned the uh, frost uh, uh, tolerance or late bud burst, or whatever. Um, these are uh, aspects which uh, need to be considered. Uh, but uh, being a breeder, uh, I should say, we should make a good compromise on the time scale. Then breeding is always a compromise on the time scale. We can show on the horizon which new genotypes could come up in 10, 20, 50 years. But sometimes you need solutions today. And therefore we need to make compromises and not only look for the ideal situation. But we can argue for an optimum, what is the optimum strategy, and work towards this strategy in order to uh, uh, come to good solutions which, have, uh, which solve our problems sustainably. And I think we need international research in pre-breeding. Uh, we need the cooperation uh, because no breeding program is fast enough to be faster than the development of resistances. But exchange could uh, help us to uh, uh, overcome problem and reach the, the, the ideal situation much faster than do it, do it on our own. And finally, I think Innovine uh, started in this direction with very good contributions. And uh, I really look forward to the talks of Oswaldo uh, Faila and uh, Ludger Hausmann concerning details which were done in uh, uh, Innovine. Thank you.